Yeah, so as, uh, as Nick said, I'm Tom Newman. I work on the ISAT2 project. I'm the project scientist along with uh, Nathan Kurtz as the deputy. And I've got a handful of slides in here from uh, Ben Smith as well. Um, ben Smith is the land ice uh, data product lead uh, for ISAT2. So you'll, you'll see some of his handiwork towards, towards the end. Just to confirm, are you seeing the slides right now? I got them. Got it, okay, yes. thanks Tom, go ahead. But I've seen these before, so it's maybe less interesting. Um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and go on. What I have for you today is basically a handful of slides on sort of just mission status, how are things going, and then a handful of slides on the land ice data products, which I thought it might be most useful, useful here. Um, all is well. We have our, our first couple of big papers come out about ISAT2, both over, over ice sheets, over sea ice, over other environments. Um, the, the land ice paper combined ISAT along with ISAT2 and, and did get picked up in a few places this spring. Um, let's go into the next slide, Nick. Yeah, current status, uh, we uh, just passed our second birthday. That was September 15th, just last week. Um, and Atlas has been transmitting laser light for almost two years. It will be two years as of uh, October 1st, whenever that is. Uh, right around just over 600 billion laser pulses to date. And Atlas and the spacecraft remain healthy and nominal, doing what, they, doing what they're designed to do. Um, for folks who haven't heard about ISAT-2 before, it's laser altimeter. It's got six beams. Uh, they're arranged in pairs. And uh, the footprint is quite a bit smaller than, uh, than the first ISAT. These are about 11 meter footprints and has a really fast pulse repetition frequency so that each footprint um, overlaps with the previous one. Those centers move forward by just 70 centimeters between shots. Um, so in clear sky conditions, you get essentially continuous along track coverage which is cool. Um, let's go on to the next one. Data products are out and online for the, the table, of, table of products here. Um, the ones that I'll talk about today are, is ATL03, that's the geolocated photon cloud. It's a giant data product. Um, and then the land ice data products. ATL06 is the long track land ice product. And I'll say a few things about the um, higher level products which are, which are coming. Um, but uh, currently we're on release three of those data products. Release four should be out in mid-January. Um, each one, each successive release makes a number of changes and corrections to previous, previous releases. Uh, release four should have better geolocation than release three. So you'll, you'll see some of those errors come down, hopefully. Um, let's go into the next one, Nick. So ATL03 is that geolocated photon product. For every photon that uh, the Atlas instrument detects and tells information to the ground for, ATL03 gives you a latitude, a longitude, and a height for that photon. Um, in addition, we take a first crack at which photons are signal and which are noise. We can go into that if anybody's interested. But if you make it a long track plot of the photon cloud, you'll get something like in the upper left corner here, uh, which is a pass over the front of an ice shelf. Uh, Maya Becker had actually pointed out this example to us, which is nice because it illustrates uh, a couple of things. See some crevasses in there, some rifting um, at the, the front of the ice shelf. And if you zoom in in the lower right to just the ice shelf front, you see that, that characteristic, uh, characteristic structure there. The uh, different colors of photons in the upper left and lower right um, indicate the different confidence levels of, of the, each individual photon, the blue ones being high confidence signal um, in the ATL03 algorithm, and there's also medium and low confidence, as well as these buffer photons. Um, let's go on to the next slide. And uh, those confidence levels in ATL03 get you close, but they're not the surface. Um, for that, you need to look at a higher level product like ATL06 that aggregates a lot of those photons together, uh, corrects the uh, elevation for, for various things and then reports out an elevation at an along, fixed long track distance. In the case of ATL06, that's uh, every 40 meters, uh, I'm sorry, every 20 meters, but it's aggregating 40 meters together. So those segments overlap. Um, because what you find in O3 is that our photon classification, you know, gets confused sometimes. It doesn't always classify photons the same way from shot to shot. So in the figure at the, on, the, on the right in the upper panel, um, the high confidence photons are that light blue and you see that all of a sudden we started classifying many more subsurface photons as high confidence signal, which it probably isn't, whereas ATL06 comes along um, and, and corrects for that. It knows enough to, uh, to converge on, on the true surface and not be fooled by these other ones. So if you look at the photon cloud, things are kind of confusing, but ATL06 
um, locks in on that that surface you want. And yeah, this was something that Maya pointed out to us uh, just uh, just a couple of weeks ago, actually. So that's one of the things we need to work on going forward on ATL03 to make that better. Um, let's go on to the next slide. Um, last time we had questions about how good are these are these data. Um, Kelly Brunt is our post-launch CalVal lead, and this is a table uh, that she put together. Um, we have uh, one paper in review now, one paper that's out already, and some of the metrics for each beam are up here on the right. Um, for uh, release three, the ATL06 product, um, the uh, absolute bias when compared with GPS data from 88 South and Antarctica uh, is just a couple of centimeters, and the precision is, is uh, less than seven centimeters. And we do expect that to get better as we get better at, uh, at doing the geolocation. As the slope of the ice sheet increases or roughness increases, those numbers get worse. Um, but if you're in a smooth part of the ice sheet, these, these numbers are, uh, are appropriate. Um, let's go on to the next one, Nick. Cool, so uh, ATL06 gives you uh, land ice elevation in the along track direction, uh, posted uh, yeah, every 20 meters along track. What ATL11 does is it aggregates all that data together to give you an elevation change product between successive passes uh, of a particular ground track. Our orbit uh, repeats um, every 91 days. We have 1,387 tracks in that orbit. So what uh, Ben is showing here for Greenland uh, is uh, by cycle. So in the upper left, um, he's got the dates on there and in the parlance of our data products, that's cycle four minus cycle three, the next one is cycle five minus cycle four and so on. Um, early in the mission, the first two cycles, we were not pointing particularly stably. Uh, we we're kind of wandering around. And so uh, ATL 11 only uses crossovers for those two cycles, but for uh, cycle three and beyond, uh, we're repeat pointing very well and we're able to make these, these kind of maps. ATL 11 should be out very soon, actually. They were just wrapping up some of the last uh, metadata complications with NSIDC. Um, so yeah, should see that uh, quite soon. Um, let's go on to the next one, Nick. Two other products that are worth knowing about are ATL 14 and 15. Those are gridded products. They are, as Ben says, on the way. Um, he's hoping to get them out uh, late 2020, so yet this year, which is great. ATL 14 is a digital elevation map, as it says there. Um, and ATL 15 are height change maps. And I actually just poked him on this. I'm like, hey, it says it's both annual and quarterly. And he said, that's right. ATL 15 is both annually and quarterly. Um, the annual elevation change has better characterized errors because it's aggregating more data. And there's also an option uh, to use an, a quarterly uh, elevation change product version of, of ATL 15. So that's better time resolution, but larger uncertainties. Um, let's go on to one more. And Nick, this one is a movie if it, if it wants to play. Um, for these figures on the left-hand panel coverage, we'll show you what the coverage is in this area. And on the right is what that height change is. So if you go ahead and click it once, um, these are the uh, quarterly height changes, and you can see the coverage through time on the left, um, and then the derived height change on the right, and it kind of looks like a mess, uh, to me anyway. Um, we'll play that one one more time. Nick, if you can go backward and forward again, it, it goes pretty quick. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, there's holes in there, and, and it's all kind of right around the middle, but if you click forward one more to look at the annual height change, now you're starting to see some structure pop out, because it's aggregating uh, that data over a year. Uh, and so this is the kind of uh, coverage you get on the left over a year cycle and then the height change on the right. Uh, and let's go one more. And I think this is my last one. Yeah. Yeah, we've been up just about two years, well on our way to meeting our, our science requirements of what we set out to do. There's lots of papers in print and more in review, which is great. Um, initial data quality, these are sort of the ballpark numbers we've been giving folks. Uh, better than 10 centimeters vertical, better than 10 meters horizontal. Middle of the ice sheet, those numbers are more like better than three centimeters in vertical and better than five meters in horizontal uh, over the smooth ice sheet. And uh, yeah, everything remains, remains healthy up in space, so all is well. Um, and that's what I had. Thanks, Tom, that's great. Uh, we have time for a quick question if anyone wants to ask something as we transition over to Mike. Okay, well, you can feel free to drop something in the chat and Tom, I'm sure will pay attention to that. Um, 
Mike Willis, are you ready to present? I am. I'll try unmuting this thing. <laughs> Perfect. So Mike today is talking about uh, automatic extraction of features from Antarctic imagery. And you should have permission to share. Perfect. Did that show up? It did. Great. Um, so we've been using some deep learning techniques uh, here at Colorado. Um, this is a, a project that uh, I've worked on. Uh, Keneal Druve, uh, who has uh, since moved on to do optional practical training uh, as a uh, computer vision engineer with Logitech, has worked on it. And uh, Mike McFerrin has also done some work on it. Basically, the premise is we're getting saturated with data, and we're going to be more saturated with data with the likes of NISAR going up, and follow on missions for, for GRACE and for ISAT and everything else like that. So um, to do large scale studies on continental scales, uh, we're gonna have to start using some faster techniques uh, to remove features or provide uh, databases of features that we're actually interested in. So as a test case, uh, we got some money from NSF uh, from the um, cyber infrastructure grants uh, to look at the Arctic DEM data set and the RIMA data set. And we're going to concentrate in this talk on RIMA. And what we're trying to do is automatically extract features. Um, examples of this, and the example I'm going to cover is uh, bedrock outcrops in Antarctica. So let's see. So manual extraction of features from topographic and imagery data sets takes a long, long time. As you know, if you've, you've tried to automatically or tried to manually uh, get uh, front positions from a glacier or something like that through time. Uh, we've customized some uh, machine learning routines uh, to derive features from the RIMA topography and the RIMA image data sets. Uh, we're using, uh, in this case, the high resolution orthorectified images that come from Worldview. Uh, we're using Worldview 3, which for the multispectral is about 1.25 meters uh, resolution. Um, and we're using two meter DEMs that we've derived from stereo um, pairs of Worldview imagery from the Digital Globe uh, constellation. For machine learning, you need to give an idea of what the machine should be looking for. And the parlance we use is the, the uh, training data set. And thankfully, PGC uh, up in Minnesota had produced a, a training data set of um, vectors of bedrock outcrops uh, back in about 2007 using the LIMA, the uh, Landsat image map of uh, Antarctica. Um, they, they extracted bedrock from that. I'm not sure how they did it. Um, but they were happy to pass that on to us, and we could use that to partially train our data set. Um, Worldview 3 has eight visible channels. Uh, we chose to use eight, four, and one. Uh, so uh, near infrared, a red edge, and actually a coastal channel. They provided the, the largest bandwidth across Worldview spectrum while remaining relatively discrete. Um, they come in 11, 12, or 11, technically. 12, but technically 11-bit images, uh, which is too much for most of the, the deep learning code out there. Um, so we took each channel and we turned it into uh, an 8-bit channel, uh, normalizing it between the third and the 97th percentile of the image band histogram. Uh, as I said, we only used, we used three channels. We used 8, 4, and 1 due to limited input space uh, that we actually have using the UNET, which is the architecture uh, that we modified uh, for our deep learning. Um, we split each RIMA tile into a 572 by 572 pixel uh, tile, uh, subtile, uh, and then with each of these three bands that we we're talking about in overlapping patches. So there is some overlap at the edge of each of our sub patches. Um, we filtered out from the training data set anything that had less than 30% bedrock cover because we were getting spurious answers where we were trying to classify things where the PGC's data was saying, hey, there's bedrock here, but really there wasn't. So we, we went hard on the, the amount of bedrock coverage and we split Antarctica into kind of six or seven geological provinces 
So we have the dry valleys and the upper peninsula and the Ellsworths where the geology is a little bit different. So the spectral return is a little bit different. Um, so we, we trained on each of these uh, different regions and uh, for training the deep learning code. Uh, we ended up with uh, 2,780 patches, which we, we split into two. We used 80% of them for training and 20% to see how well we're doing once the training has run. Uh, we used augmented uh, data routines where we uh, shifted it, flipped it, rotated images, just so when we have the training data, you can expand the amount of training that you can do because you take one image and you make the computer look at it in different ways. So we, we tripled or quadrupled the amount of imagery that we could use, but using just uh, transformations of the image. Um, we did try some uh, different architectures. We tried DeepNet3, but we ended up using the, the fairly standard UNet conv convolutional neural network, which is, is basically uh, an autoencoder, which you can think of as an unsupervised classification. Uh, system. Um, so we tried UNET straight out the box, which is uh, uh, we used a three by three uh, convolution with a rect rectilinear lookup. Um, this uh, uh, a rectilinear uh, unit activation um, abstracted with a five five layer or five depth uh, unit. This overfit the data too much. It was, it was running inefficiently compared to what we could do in the future. But we, we did try this as a, a, a normal setup, a first setup. Uh, training with this took about three to four hours for the whole of Antarctica. Um, and then when we get a REMA tile uh, from Worldview, uh, we could turn it into vectors uh, in between 2.4 and 4 seconds. Uh, using a fairly high-end NVIDIA GPU, uh, uh, a Tesla V100. Um, so this was um, our early tile test. Uh, at this point, we were using 256 by 256 by 3 subtiles. And uh, this is the input image on the left and the output image um, where we used uh, clustering and polygonizing to provide crude bedrock outlines. And you can see that there are hints, the yellow is where the system is saying, hey, this is bedrock, and the purple is saying, this is not bedrock, it's a binary output. And you can see there are hints that are going, it's going okay, but we actually needed to, to improve, in, increase the size of the subtiles we were using because the system uh, wasn't converging fast enough. It was converging after 30 epochs or so. So we, uh, modified UNET to be a three-layer system with larger subtiles, and it ran a lot faster, and it ran to convergence a lot quicker. So that's an early result, and then this is, uh, this is a, a further result where we dilate the um, vectors we get back, uh, we erode them, and it filters out some of the holes, and we segment with our code with some edge detectors. And we eventually use GDAL's um, polygonized tool to turn a raster, binary raster, into uh, a vector. So this is an original ortho image. This is the Lima bedrock map for the image. And then this is what we get after two and a half seconds uh, running our UNET code. So black is not bedrock and yellow is bedrock. Uh, another example, so this is the Lima bedrock mask, uh, just a zoom in on the previous image. There's some noise and the edges aren't particularly great compared to reality. And then this green one is what we see. Uh, change the color scheme, I apologize for that, we'll change it again. Green is bedrock this time, uh, anything not green is not bedrock. And then just finally, um, this is the Canada Glacier, I think. Uh, again, this is the Lima mask. And then that's our mask. Um, so we, we still have some little jumps at the edge, which you can see around here, but otherwise this is bedrock classified, this is not bedrock. And so um, our skill routines, uh, our source and dice coefficients are very good. Um, we're good at recall, we're pretty good at precision. Um, and it suggests that we can apply this to lots of stuff. Uh, be it Arctic DEM, be it RIMA, 
Um, we're thinking that we can apply this to uh, time tag glacier terminus positions, which take a long time for people to do. Uh, this will do them in under a second. Um, sea ice configuration, crevasse mapping, etc. I mean, it's, we're going to put the code out there in the public. Uh, so go for it with ideas that you have. And just a thanks to Mike McFerrin, who helped us with this project, and we got some money from this from NSF Cyber Infrastructure. Thanks. Thanks, Mike, for a great talk. Uh, do we have any questions? I have one if, if nothing comes up in the chat. You talked about the augmented training data where you shifted and rotated tiles. It, is the algorithm sensitive to orientation at that? I found that kind of interesting. Uh, no, it's, it's basically using what's called a SIFT routine to do that. And so that's, uh, it, that doesn't care about the orientation of the tile. What it sometimes cares about scale, um, but not too much. Uh, SIFT is pretty powerful when you're looking at what's essentially a 2D object. You're taking the 3D reality and you're turning it into a 2D representation when you're taking a flat image of it. Um, SIFT has more of a problem when you're trying to do that with three-dimensional shapes and moving it around. But no, um, because of SIFT, that works pretty well for data augmentation. Hmm, cool. All right, well, thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, the second convener, Uta Hertzbelt, who is uh, speaking on glacial acceleration, rifting, calving, and melt in West Antarctica measured using ISAT2. So Uta, feel free to share your screen when ready. Yeah, hang on. This back. Now is it full screen? Yeah, right? Yeah, it is. You're good. Okay, except, all right, here we go. Okay, so it wasn't actually my fault. I'm convener and speaking in this. This just sort of falls in your lap. Anyways, thanks for joining. I'll talk about glacial acceleration, rifting, carving, and melt processes and their measurement using ISA2. The talk is co-authored by Tom Trano, Matt Lawson, and Adam Hayes also online so when I'm done you can say a word and you'll come into view. We are at University of Colorado Boulder in the Department of Electric and Computer Engineering. Of course we made Tom Newman give the first talk so I could just start right in the middle of things. So thanks for introducing ISAT to Tom. The topics in this talk will touch on glacial acceleration and their different, two different types including search glaciers and fast moving glaciers. A little bit of the ISA2 airborne validation campaign over one of these glaciers. Then we'll take a closer look at rifting and carving and fracturing, especially for Pine Island Glacier, and touch on water on ice. The last few minutes will be spent talking about modeling and actually how we can share our results as some type of a cyber infrastructure for others to use. So I dug this old figure up, which is actually not that old, it's just from 10 to 15 years ago, when we were happy to have information on this kind of a scale showing elevation change in Pine Island Glacier, looking at glass minus ERS1 shortly after ISAT had launched, and I plotted the tracks on top. And now you can see only fast forward to the present, we can get information on ice sheet and ice front and whatnot elevation changes at something like 70 centimeters, which is a truly amazing difference. And I mean, back in the day, we were like, this is high resolution. We really have to redefine things now that we have ISA2. Taking a closer look at the dynamic processes behind this, there are examples of Bering Glacier in Alaska, which is a temperate land terminating search glacier. Nick Ribrian in Svalbard has a different search dynamics because it's in the Arctic. And of course it carves into the ocean and Jakobshaven's Jakobshaven. If you take a look at these Kaiser images, we, which were co-collected with the ISA2 data to the point possible, you can now see that we are able to trace the surface of a crevasse. Can you actually see the mouse? So this makes some sense. So you can trace the surface of really complex morphological features 
in and out of Jakob's Haven, and these are impressions of fracturing in the glacier, which experiences approximately the same type and direction of force for a long time. Whereas if you have a surge, there's an event which makes the surface crack once, but as time goes on, you actually see material changes, which is crevasses. Actually, I wanna show this. So which, where you can see that there's water under, in the, in the crevasses, and we actually have an algorithm which allows us to detect this water and approximately measure its volume. Okay, if you take a look at such a surge glacier, it is not only beautiful and interesting to look at, it has the advantage of exhibiting all sorts of surface characteristics, such as here, ordnance green is slow moving, it's right next to it, in slow and fast motion, which makes it an ideal place for a field validation. So we had an NSF project to study the search and piggybacked on that, I said to evaluation using RTK GPS, like Connors operating the GPS base station down here and so forth and airborne laser data collection, I'll buy it at 905 nanometer as opposed to the green band of I said to. We also asked for acquisition of SkySat. SkySat, if you haven't heard, is a commercial satellite sort of launches droves of satellites which image the earth. They're great if you can have an image and these data are now available through what's called the NASA SmallSat program. Okay, so now a bit on how we retrieve surfaces from the ISA2 photon cloud, which is ADLO3 as described in the first talk. We designed an algorithm specifically to analyze the data from the new sensor, which is a micropulse photon counting laser altimeter, as opposed to pulse limited altimetry, which was there for all lasers and radars past. And we have an algorithm called the DDAI is designed for surface height determination over crevassed or otherwise morphologically complex terrain. It adapts automatically to changes in background characteristics and to roughness and deals heights at sensor resolution, which is, if there's not a cloud in the sky, 70 centimeters. There are, if you know, uh, stronger channels and weaker channels, and we can do this type of analysis for both. A small look at the evaluation data shows you, in essence, we get the correct depths and spacing of crevasses. Of course, we don't have this kind of accuracy as you have for non-moving objects over smooth ice. Okay, how does this compare to ADL-06? So ADL-06 is great if you wanna do ice sheet elevation changes, but if you're into the high resolution changes, you may wanna check out the DDAI results. Now we're going to Pine Island Glacier finally in West Antarctica, which is here we show in the left a Landsat image with one kilometer segments of ISA2 data superimposed. There is a six month difference between the Landsat image and the ISA2 collections of things don't match like totally exactly, that's why. We see that we can find sort of slanted blocks individually and we can find crevasses and fractures. So fractures are sort of more from a dynamic point of view and bigger and rifts. So rifts is the macro scale analysis of damage in ice, whereas fracturing and crevassing is more a mesoscale damage. Also, if you're into carving, you can actually see this slanting slope in the front of the carving, at the carving front. Few more of these because we like them so much. So this is just same day, different beam. We see all the jumbled melange in the shear zone, which is segment 33, 34, 35. And we see the Sastrugi over here around 46. And we can also see that 48 is actually two and a half kilometers off. So there's a change in the position of the carving front with the, over these six months detected. So you can do sort of a few nice things with the type of data. The next feature people are into when they're doing change processes is melt ponds. And so for instance, this is now from Amory, which is in East Antarctica. Apologies, but anyways, we found made quickly another algorithm which has the advantage of following the surface if the surface splits, you get top and bottom, and that way you can measure volume of melt ponds as have occurred over the Amory ice shelf. 
and you can also see you can run this over long tracks and it doesn't make any false positives. Okay, here's some ponds in Yakovshav and Ispre which show you properties of like when you get to the surface, really you can hit small floating icebergs and such. Now, what can we do with this type of nonsense here? So for instance, you can use water in Karasis as an information on end glacial hydrology. And this is actually more important than people may realize because there are people in electrical engineering which have been, who have been trying to build instrumentation to actually measure water and ice. And it's not trivial to get this type of information, but it characterizes how ice dynamics changes. And from surface height, you can get surface roughness which you can use to classify crevassed and uncrevassed regions. And then you can push this all into a full stocks model of ice dynamics as came out of Tom Trano's thesis. Press my forward button. Okay, so you can read this at your leisure. The idea is to share results from the DDAIs implemented as a cyber, cyber infrastructure. You should go to the yellow box and look at topic two early or topic three early adopter means if there's some one of you out there who has a certain project you would like high resolution isa two surfaces for then you can work with us tell us what we have to change or ask us to process that segment for whatever research you may have in mind before we generally share the data stuff to read up on if you didn't like the rest you won't like this either thanks for listening <coughs> now what <laughs> oh, now Tom and Matt and Adam are supposed to say hi so you can see the co-authors in person. I have to say stop, share, and people will be bigger. Thank you, Uta. Uh, you made it just in under the wire. As a convener, that's important. Um, I, all right. Hey, Matt, <laughs> Tom, you have to say hi. Okay, they have to say hi in the discussion, I suppose. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, we will save questions for the final discussion. Uh, yeah. And why don't we transition now to uh, Mickey Mackey, who is from Stanford University, presenting on uh, quantification of uncertainty in subglacial hydrology using geostatistical simulation. Mickey. Hello. Hello. All right, I go by Mickey and I'm a fourth year PhD student at Stanford working with Dusty Schroeder. And my research is on using geostatistics to generate stochastic simulations of subglacial topography. And in this talk, I'm gonna discuss how we use stochastic modeling to quantify uncertainty in subglacial hydrology. So imagine you have some set of possible topographic con configurations given some measurement constraints. So you can imagine that you would have increasing uncertainty moving away from a measurement point. In reality, we use topography that looks something like the mean of this distribution. But the problem is this topography is unrealistically smooth and it doesn't sample the uncertainty space. In this project, I discuss what happens when we generate many topographic realizations and apply a simple water routing model to each of them instead of to the mean. Does this change the, our interpretation of that system? Uh, so let me introduce you to the idea of stochastic simulations. The aim of stochastic simulation is to reproduce the spatial statistics of a feature. Um, and this is commonly used in modeling groundwater hydrology. Uh, because the heterogeneity of the subsurface is important for water flow. And so I think this makes it a useful tool for modeling subglacial hydrology. There are many ways to produce stochastic simulations, but in this project, I was interested in using mass conservation as a secondary constraint to produce simulations. So the idea is that the simulation has the spatial statistics or heterogeneity of radar measurements but it, it should still be correlated with mass conservation. So to implement the simulation, we start by selecting a grid cell that we wanna simulate. And then we use all the available data to generate a probability distribution of possible elevation values at that point. 
And well, if you were doing some sort of deterministic interpolation like Kriging, you would select the mean. We draw randomly from this distribution to generate a simulated value. Then this value becomes part of the conditioning data and we repeat this process over and over until every cell has been populated. So how do we get to, to this probability distribution? We use a co-Kriging estimator, which is a multivariate form of, of Kriging. I know many of you have used Kriging before, but as a quick recap, Kriging predicts unknown values by computing the weighted sum of other points. And these weights should account for the redundancy between nearby points, the proximity of points to the unknown, and the variance of the topography. Uh, we determine these weights using a variogram, which calculates uh, your, your variance as a function of distance between two points. So as your distance uh, from another point increases, you would expect the variance to go up. The variance is, or the variogram is directly related to your covariance function. And you use the covariance function to set up a system of linear equations that you solve to find your Kriging weights. Because we have two data sources, the radar and the mass conservation, we use co-creaking. And so now we have to define a covariance function for the radar measurements, the mass conservation estimates, and also a cross covariance function that describes the variability between the two. This creates a really large and unstable system of equations that in practice often can't be solved. So we have to use some sort of assumption to be able to, to perform this estimate. We use a Markov model, and I don't have time to go into the technical details, but basically um, we assume that subsets of our data are conditionally independent of each other. And that allows us to set up our covariance functions in a way that the co creaking matrix can be solved. So these are our uh, experimental variograms from the data. You can see that the mass conservation topography has a lower variance than the radar. And um, there's also some anisotropy because the topography is oriented along flow. So we modeled the variograms using the Markov model assumptions. And we, we um, modeled them in, in two directions to account for the anisotropy. And so now that we have this, our, we have our co-creating estimator and we can perform the simulations. So these are, these are some of the realizations we produced. And you can see that the, the, the realizations have the same large scale features as the mass conservation topography, but much greater small scale heterogeneity. And if you take the mean and standard deviation of these, you get um, an uncertainty estimate. We then applied a, a simple water routing model to each of them. And what we see is that while some of the channels are pretty similar across different realizations, a lot of the, the tail behavior uh, was pretty different. So we don't have water flowing out of the same place in every realization. And this could be really important if you're interested in a water budget. I also wanna highlight that this uh, deep valley feature at Jakobshaven Glacier is pretty unusual and that I would expect uh, other glaciers um, to have far more variability in the flow path locations. You can also take the mean of all of these um, uh, flow path or hydrological realizations um, to assess your confidence in having a channel at a given location. And this could be useful for adding context to geophysical observations. So in summary, we've used stochastic simulation to produce topographic realizations that allow us to quantify hydrologic uncertainty with respect to topographic uncertainty. And this project uh, was recently accepted in JGLAC, and so I hope it will be out in the, in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thanks, Mickey. That was a great talk. Um, we have time for a question or two. And I can kind of get the ball rolling again. Um, Mickey, when you say you draw from the kind of statistical distribution when you realize the bed, 
does that take into account some assumption of uh, spatial correlation of the observations between, or I guess of the bed elevation between observations? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly um, what the covariance functions allow for is you're explicitly quantifying the relationships between the data points. And it, is there a, a requirement from outside training data that, that fixes the roughness, the basically whatever the spatial um, correlation is, or that's just prescribed from the radar data that are within your domain, basically? Yeah, that it's just from the radar. Cool, thank you. So, Mickey, if you're into this kind of thing, as one, <laughs> yeah, nice talk. And it actually works pretty well in the end. One of my very first students did sort of what you did, but for sleep plot topography. But then, rather than mass balance, which doesn't make any sense in that connection, we tried a few different models, which went from a fractal model. So you can actually replace the experimental covariance function with a simple multi-scale fractal model, which then allows you a bit to tune what you get for high resolution variability or high resolution roughness. Like you want to say, okay, so this is instrument error. We want it better or we want it worse. And then you can compare the whole, well, the whole connection between interpolation and simulation and spectral interpolation and see what kind of an extrapolator or simulator might work best. And yeah. so for, I'm not saying it doesn't work, but there aren't many takers for this kind of mathematical analysis. So you may want to see what else, what other simulators might work. Mm. Yeah, one of the things we've been, um, you know, looking into is the fact that there's a lot of measurement uncertainty in, in radar and um, it's not exactly easy to quantify. Um, and so, you know, we have some crossover errors, but they're not necessarily dead on and we don't have them everywhere. Um, and so we've been looking into approaches for, for, you know, basically simulating measurement uncertainty and then using that, you know, basically simulating uncertainty values at different data points and um, and and then simulating data, <laughs> right? To um, yeah. so then use in simulations um, as as a way of, of kind of uh, getting around some of these um, like you know finer technical issues. Thanks so much, Mickey. Okay. This was a great talk. Um, what happened to our break? Never yes. mind. Yes. Yes. So uh, we're going to take five minutes, a uh, five minute break, and then. We'll, we'll come back with Philip Arndt, who's going to tell us about uh, measuring depths of surface melt features with ISAT2. And Uta will be uh, proctoring the second half of this session. Okay, so, so half till 2.50, sure. Yeah. Yes, 4.50 Eastern, 3.50 Central, 2.50 Mountain, 1.50 Pacific. For okay. international visitors, you'll have to choose your own time zone. Um, we'll see you back in four minutes. Okay, I mean, do you want to start the next talk? So for those of you who might have just joined, we are getting to the second half of our leading edge technology session of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet Meeting. And our next speaker is Philip Arndt from UCSD Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He will be talking about a new technique for measuring the depths of surface melt features on ice sheets from ISA2. There you go, Philip. All right, uh, thanks, Yuzin. And I hope you all are ready to hear even more about ISAT2. So first of all, how do I advance slides? Oh, there we go. So first of all, this, uh, this was a project um, that a lot of people contributed to um, across lots of different um, institutions and in really difficult times where you couldn't actually meet each other. So a lot of this is uh, powered by Slack, Zoom, Google Docs, and so on. So first of all, um, why do we care about melt lakes um, on ice sheets and ice shelves? Um, I'm sure all of you know um, the concept of hydrofracture, where basically water enters crevasses and then pries them open. Um, because of the extra pressure that the water adds. So if you actually have lakes on ice shelves, um, those melt lakes um, 
provide a really large reservoir of surface water that could drain potentially into such crevasses and just sustain this uh, fracture propagation. So I don't know why this animation isn't showing up, but on the bottom right, you see Larsen D ice shelf that collapsed after there was a lot of melt lakes on top, which apparently you can't see right now, but I'm sure most of you are aware. Oh, now it's running. Okay, so you've heard most, most things that are important about the ISA-2 laser altimetry mission. So I'm just gonna say the most important parts for observing melt pond depths are that it uses a green light laser. So that one is able to um, penetrate through water and basically look through to the bottom of melt lakes. And the other really important thing is that it uses um, single photon detection technology. So you basically have this data product ATL03 of geolocated photons, um, which I also have an example here for, um, similar to what you see from, saw from Tom. Um, you see on Shackleton ice shelf here a rift, and then you also see these melt ponds that are towards the left and the right. Um, here one that has an ice cover and on the right it doesn't have, but the really important thing here is that you actually see the flat surface and the bottom here. So we took a look at a very particular set of um, these four melt lakes on Amory Ice Shelf that experiences melt during most seasons um, across um, close to the grounding line. And so the data looks something like this. Um, so again, you see through the melt ponds, you see the flat surface and you see the lake bed. And then the orange line here is the ATL06 um, land ice elevation product, which is just designed to detect one surface. So we see that it goes a little bit crazy over melt ponds. And therefore, if we want to detect the depth of these melt ponds, we really have to look at the photon cloud data. So this little uh, red circle just shows a double reflection here. I just want to quickly say that that is related to the instrument. Um, so for example, here on the left, this is an example from Greenland off a very deep melt pond. You actually see three after pulses or lines after the initial return. And that's just due to um, the particularities of the instrument and those should be ignored. So back to our melt ponds. So we got together with all these collaborators I showed earlier and tried to figure out how deep they are. And we also submitted a paper to the GRL special issue and I set two for that. So you might wanna ask why exactly did we just pick those lakes? Why in East Antarctica? Why not more? Well, the thing is, we had a very particular situation there where we had three satellites, ISAT-2 and Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8, all looking at the same melt ponds on the same day without clouds or anything. And that's really important for us to compare data from different satellite missions um, because all these melt water systems evolve really fast. Um, so we really wanna make sure we're looking at the same thing. So we had five different groups contribute um, depth retrieval algorithms from ISAT2 um, that you can see on, on the left here. And we also had two groups that contributed imagery-based methods based on the Lancet 8 and Sentinel-2 data. And we wanted to compare these. So I'm just gonna quickly show what the SURF algorithm does that um, I came up with. Essentially, when you have this data, um, you first just want to find the flat surface, which is just a histogram binning task and trying to find a narrow peak. So you get these photons as the surface and the surface elevation of the pond. Then you want to take out um, these specular return double reflection things that are not actual surfaces. And if you remove all this from the data set, you can fit a smooth line to whatever is left. So you get something like this and yeah, there's a line. And then you basically can just take the difference between the surface of the water and the bottom of the lakes. And this gives you your um, depth of the melt ponds after you correct it for the change of the speed of light and water. Um, now the problem was if you want to compare a different bunch of different algorithms on what they do with this data, um, we kind of need some baseline to compare it against. And we didn't have any actual ground truth data because yeah, you 
it's hard to go to an Arctic and just measure, measure out melt ponds. So what we did is that we crowdsourced this and we basically made a bunch of people draw lines into these photon cloud data. Um, we got, I think, 56 contributions from different people, some on the ISO2 science team, some just UCSD students or family members. Um, and that's what the data looked like. So from that, we could construct a ensemble manual depth of these lakes from the ISA2 data. Um, we also wanted to make sure that um, the depths that I said two people picked and um, and that other people who don't usually deal with this data aren't significantly different and essentially we showed that they're essentially the same so that's what this is so here's what all the different algorithms that were contributed um, got on these melt ponds and you can see they're they're somewhat all over the place, but they cluster around the surface that we have as our targets. But the image-based ones are definitely shallower and have jumps that really don't relate to the um, shape of the lake bed. So if we, if we take a closer look and just essentially look at here on the left, you see histograms of basically the error between our manual proxy for the ground truth and each individual algorithm. Um, then you see that a lot of the ISAP ones are relatively close um, to not being biased and also have relatively low standard deviations, whereas like the imagery based ones are a little bit further off. And just to basically summarize this, um, we just took the mean off all the image-based methods and all the I said two-based methods and plot this over the um, ATL03 data while correcting also for the refractive index. And we see again that the image-based methods basically underestimate the water depths here. So this really opens up opportunities if we have coincident data of satellite imagery and ISA2 data that we can use the ISA2 data to train models or to tune these imagery-based models to give us more exact results with greater coverage. So main takeaways here are ISA2 is a great satellite mission that can look through water and um, basically for the first time we can just observe more or less directly the depth of meltwater bodies from space. And if we take this together with imagery, then that can be used to improve models with greater coverage that give you meltwater depths and such. So in the future, really what you need is a lightweight algorithm that identifies where we find melt in the ISAT2 data, and that's in progress. And then you can basically align those with imagery data to generate a training set that relates these two, and then you can tune the image-based algorithms to the ISET2 derived depths, or you can just train a purely statistical model in a machine learning kind of way. And then obviously it would also be great if somebody could actually measure, measure the depth of melt lakes around Greenland and Antarctica so we can validate our results. And yeah, that's it. Uh, Uta, you're on mute. Should be. Okay. All right. Sounds good. I think you should put your questions in the chat box and we have then something to discuss in the 20 minutes after the last talk. So the next speaker is Joey Durkin of Ohio State University, who will be talking about re-evaluating the elastic response to ice mass changes in Antarctica. Joey, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, my name is Joey Durkin, and I'm a, and I'm a postdoc at OSU. And um, this project's about uh, trying to put some estimates on the uncertainties of elastic deformation of the Antarctic crust. Um, so here, this map is showing the contours of 
annual sustained uplift of the solid earth in the Amundsen Sea region in West Antarctica, it, it gets quite large up to about um, 50 millimeters a year. And this is the combination of um, the earth's immediate spring-like elastic response to uh, ice that's being lost presently, as well as the mantle's delayed viscous response to the integrated history of ice change. And um, because both of these components are uh, large, they're actually big enough to change the topography of um, the earth to, uh, in a way that um, helps stabilize against grounding line entry. It's, and so it's, it's, um, it's important to get, a, uh, to get a handle on both of these parts. Um, but when we go out and take measurements of the, of the solid earth uplift rate, like at these GPS locations shown in the black squares, we're just getting at the, the total amount of uplift. And what we really want to have is um, it broken down into these two component parts. But uh, it's, it's pretty difficult to get good a priori estimates of um, the mantle rheology. And um, on the other hand, we can understand the Earth's elastic properties through seismology, and we can also get estimates of how fast the ice is melting presently. And um, these are used to, to model the elastic deformation. And once we have this elastic deformation model, we can remove it from our total uplift to get the viscous component inferred as the residual. And so even though these two things are thought of as um, separate a lot of times, uh, our viscous, our, the, the inferences that we make about the viscous deformation directly depend on how well we can model the elastic deformation. So in, uh, in this part of Antarctica, the elastic component is, is pretty large. Like at, at this GPS site, it's about, it accounts for about 25% of the total uplift. Um, but uh, whatever kind of uh, biases and uncertainties may exist in these modeled elastic deformation rates have, have pretty much been largely unexplored. And so that's, so that's the goal of this um, project. So, okay, so to think about how to get at elastic deformation uncertainties, first explain the, the standard workflow of how this is done. So usually the typical workflow is to uh, describe the Earth as a one-dimensional radially symmetric planet where each layer is uh, defined by the, the Earth's average properties. So like, for, for example, PREM, the preliminary reference Earth model. Um, but, uh, you know, in Antarctica, in many, is, it, Antarctica is not exactly like the average Earth. And um, in addition to this, there's three-dimensional variations. And so to describe both of these things, um, we take new 3D uh, seismic velocity models of the, of the crust and upper mantle, along with um, 3D density models, and sample them to create an ensemble of one-dimensional profiles. So then we can, take, um, we can take each of these 1D planet Antarcticas, basically, and model the deformation using each of these and get a distribution of elastic uplift rates and then get our uncertainties from those distributions. The second source of uncertainty that I'm gonna consider is um, how, how, how do uncertainties in converting ice volume change to ice mass change propagate into this? And so for this, I'm using altimetry-based DHT and uh, to, to describe the, the, the density of this, um, I'm saying that, uh, let's say that all of the ice that's flowing faster than some velocity is changing in elevation from ice dynamics and give it the density of ice. And everything that's slower than that velocity is changing from surface mass balance and will give it the surface density. And then that uh, threshold velocity is uh, changed in each iteration of the ensemble um, between 10 and 100 meters a year. So looking at how that uh, plays out for the whole continent, I want to first describe um, the effects at this location in the bottom left at this Helmo site in West Antarctica. So in orange, in orange is um, the distribution of elastic uplift rates that we get from just modifying the parameters of the Earth. It ends up being actually not too important. You can get quite a long ways just describing the Earth as, as, as a global average. 
Across the continent, this effect counts for less than uh, 5%. The uncertainties are less than 5% of the elastic uplift rate. On the other hand, the, the density is, um, pretty, is quite important and it affects all of the, all of the GPS sites. Um, overall, the, the elastic uplift rate uncertainties are about 20% or less for these sites and it, it's dominated by the density. And uh, you know, to just explore this a little bit further, um, I wanna show these results are a little bit preliminary, but I didn't wanna miss the opportunity to hear the opinion of this group on this. So I'm, I'm, I also consider a, a second density scenario where we can say, well, okay, all of the elevation change is due to some combination of surface mass balance and uh, ice dynamics. And we can take uh, the density as a, a weighted average of the surface density and ice density. And then that, um, the weight of the surface mass balance component is varied between 25 and 75%. And what's ever left over is, is the ice, ice density. And what we find from doing this is actually um, pretty similar results. That here, the uncertainties are much more uniform. They all, vary, they all are between about 10 and 15%. Um, so this is, it doesn't really change the results of um, was previously shown, but uh, you know what we can determine. What we can tell from this is that biases and uncertainties in the elastic deformation rates at the at the PPS sites, um, they're not going to fundamentally alter what we understand about glacial isostatic adjustment. Uh, but um, we now have this new um, tool available to make interstudy comparisons that we didn't have before, and these uncertainties will be important as we explore more advanced mantle rheologic real, models. Okay, so now um, instead of just looking at the GPS sites, I'm also going to look at how does this, how does this alter things uh, near the grounding line of these um, fast uh, thinning outlet glaciers in West Antarctica. So here on the left is the elastic uplift rate at uh, Pine Island, Flights, PSK glaciers. It's, it's quite large. It's about 10 to uh, 10 to 25 millimeters a year. Um, and on the right hand side is the relative difference uh, between using the Antarctic specific elastic parameters versus PREM. The difference, uh, the difference from this is quite modest, about less than 5%, even directly underneath the glaciers. Um, but the seismic velocity models that we're currently using are uh, not very um, they're, they are not very well able to resolve the very shallow properties of the earth. And to demonstrate how this could be important, I'm, I, I'm adding a one kilometer thick layer of compliant sediment on the top of the earth. And once this, once this, very, once this compliant layer of sediment is added, um, the elastic structures, is, it, 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 the elastic uplift rates at these grounding lines are quite a bit larger than what we'd expect from PREM. Um, it varies between 10 and 20 percent. And this, um, the, the enhanced elastic uplift rate from the presence of the sedimentary layers is something that could uh, amplify um, solid earth processes that act to stabilize grounding line retreat. Um, but as I said, this is just a hypothetical layer. And, and so we're working with um, Doug Weens and his PhD student to use uh, newer seismic velocity models that do put um, some better constraints on what these shallow earth properties are. So to include this, um, uh, at, the, at the GNSS sites, uh, uncertainties are in the elastic deformation are dominated by the propagation of density uncertainties. It's not something that is going to really change what we understand about GIA, but it, it, these are something that need to be considered when we start to, when, we, when we're exploring more advanced mantle rheologies. And then on the other hand, in the, at, near the grounding lines is highly dependent on the elastic properties of the very shallow uh, portions of the earth. So um, if you have any questions, I'm thrilled to talk more about it. Please feel free to email me at, or, you know, get in contact anyway. Anyway, thank you. All right, Joey, thanks very much for an interesting contribution. We are 
better moving on to the next speaker. The, we will stay in the realm of solid earth geophysics of West Antarctica. The next speaker is Jasmine Hansen from CU Boulder, and she will talk to us about characterizing contemporary solid earth feedbacks in West Antarctica using high resolution mass load changes. Jasmine, take it away. Can you see my screen? Yes, yeah. I okay. see it. Looks all good. Okay, so this, yeah, this carries on very closely from what Joey just talked about and is part of my PUC research that I'm doing at the University of Colorado Boulder in collaboration with the folks at Ohio State and uh, it's part of the kind of Polnack sphere of research. And so, again, we're kind of looking in this Amonton Sea embayment section of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet and there, you know, we have these big glaciers like Pine Island and Thwaites and this map is underlain just by measures so you can see where the, the kind of glaciers are. But then are these black kind of dots are the locations of all of the bedrock GNSS sites that have been put out by the Polnet project to record the response of the solid earth to this kind of change in, in ice mass and, and things like that. And so again, we're interested in the solid earth deformation that's going on. And as Joey you know, mentioned, there's a lot of motion going on here. And so we have this viscoelastic deformation that's really fast because of what is deemed to be, a, you know, people think is a low viscosity upper mantle. And so on the right, we have the same contours um, from Valentina Valletta's model. And we see uplift rates of in excess of 40 millimeters a year from this viscoelastic component alone. And then we have the second component, the elastic deformation which is again the same concept that we're going to talk about here, which is this rapid changes to present day surface mass variations that occur over small scales. And we're concentrating at the moment on these sites so-called in yellow. And this graph in the middle was again from Valentina Barletta's paper and just kind of serves to show how rapidly some of the locations of these sites are going up. So Tony Mountain, which is in the bottom right of the map figure is going up more than 40 millimeters a year and and a lot of this as Joey mentioned is due to viscoelastic deformation but a, a big chunk of it oh well a chunk of it is from elastic deformation and it's important to understand what's going on here because they're using these sites to constrain geophysical models estimate you know viscoelastic properties of the crust and to constrain rates of GIA and this is used in modeling and forward modeling and so, you know, if, if elastic is occurring nearly instantaneously in some cases and over very small scales, how important is understanding mass changes that are occurring in very high spatiotemporal resolution? And so, for example, this site, Inman, sits right next to Pine Island Glacier, about 30 kilometers away. And so how important is the resolution of the grid that we're using to detect how much elastic deformation that we see? And so for the most recent ice to, SAT to ISAT 2 altimetry grid, they have this elastic rebound solution that they use. Um, and they're using similar techniques, but they're using a certain grid resolution. And so we're interested to see how, whether high grid resolutions are important. And there's already been a bit of move towards looking at this aspect of things. And so the two figures on the right are from Eric LaRaw's paper. And he's concentrating on the grounding lines, in this case at Thwaites, and running a sequence of models to look at how you get different predictions of grounding line retreat when you take into account different resolutions and different short wavelength solid earth effects. And so this graph in the middle, if you have a resolution or grid resolution of two kilometers for your load grids, you have a much higher vertical displacement at the center of your disk than you do if you use you know, even four, you know, you go from just above 50 to 25. And so, you know, these initial results indicate that there's a high sensitivity to the grid resolution that you've loaded your, you know, solid earth models with. And this has been kind of compounded. Jonathan Bamber is suggesting a similar thing that we need these high resolution grids to accurately estimate these corrections. And so the purpose of the study that I'm doing is to look at how the resolution of surface load changes impacts elastic deformation at these sites and whether it's kind of important to look at. And so what we're doing is we're again focusing on these sites in yellow 
and we, I'm using the reference elevation model of Antarctica two meter elevation models to build sub kilometer time series of surface change. And then using a similar technique to Joey, using velocity thresholds for calculating density distributions, we're converting from elevation change to mass. And then we model the response of the crust to that load change. And then we do the same with the ISAT grids and the Cryosat 2 grids. And the Cryosat 2 grids are interesting because they cover the same time span as our REMA models and a lot of the GPS time series, whereas we have this gap in the ISAT and ISAT 2 record which has obviously been filled by this grid, but there's still kind of a gap there. And so to make the REMA grids, I've taken over a thousand strips from the REMA archive at the PGC. And then these strips need to be tied down to a reference surface because they, to improve their vertical accuracy. And because there's not much bedrock in this region, we have to look at other points that don't move very much that sit within the ice. And so, to find these points that don't move vertically or horizontally and are somewhat static, we take the NASA measures data set and we identify points that have a velocity below a certain threshold and we do the same with the long-term ISAT2 rate of elevation change and slope and we come up with these points and so if you see on the right this kind of orange point within the polygon indicate points that don't move very quickly in our elevation models that we can use to tie down the strips at two meters. And then once we have all these strips, we run a weighted linear regression um, through kind of on a pixel by pixel basis to get surface elevation change using, based on this cost algorithm that YJ Zeng has used in his paper in the Arctic. And then, so for an example on the left, we have a surface elevation change grid um, for the Bear Peninsula and we've clipped it to grounded ice. And then we integrate that to get the volume change. And then we use this kind of thresholding approach using the measures velocity data set to identify locations that we think might be fern elevation or fern and surface mass balance changes versus ice. And within those blue polygons, that's just kind of an example of how we would threshold that. And we play around with having a grid that's 100% ice and a grid that's 100% fern. Um, and then we end up with a mass change rate, which is this diagram on the right. And you can see we have really high spatial resolution of surface mass change. And then what we do is we nest these grids in, in this case, the ISAT2 grid, because we don't just want the grids just to end, because that's not very representative of how the Earth works. The crust just doesn't finish. And so we nest them in the Corso grids. And so this figure on the right shows an example of nesting the very preliminary grids that we have within the course and network framework. And then we run a series of experiments. So we use a radius that is kind of, we deem to be coarser, and then we gradually use higher and higher resolutions of this nested grid down to sub kilometer resolution, and then look at what the outputs of our elastic deformation is. And we use a similar kind of well, we use the same procedure that Joey is talking about in his last talk, where we use ensembles of elastic profiles and calculate the deformation that occurs from the love load numbers and compute the Green's functions. And again, we're using this West Antarctic ensemble to look at the differences between, you know, whether prem is not representative of the upper portion of the crust. And these are very preliminary results. And so in this diagram on the left, on the x-axis, we have the site ID for our different sites. And on the y-axis, we have modeled elastic uplift rate in millimeters a year. And then the different colored squares are the different disk radiuses of our modeling kind of estimates. And what you can see is that in almost all of the sites, we see very small changes in the modeled elastic uplift rate, depending on just changing grid resolution, right? So we're trying to isolate the effect of grid resolution alone and not messing around with everything else. And, and that's really interesting, you know, why are we seeing this like low, you know, not high amount of changes for these different resolution changes. And so these are our preliminary results. And then the next steps, I'm interested to look at how this very spatially, you know, are the, is the reason we're seeing this insensitivity to grid resolution because we're quite far away in inverted commas from Pine Island Glacier. You know, Eric LaRose shows that we have this big drop down, if you look on the left, 
with the vertical displacement with distance and so maybe we're not seeing a sensitivity because the sites are actually far enough away that grid resolution isn't that important because the mass changes are kind of not that extreme next to the site. And then I want to compare it to perhaps the ISAT2 grids not nesting them so just the ISAT2 mesh and then the cryosat2 mesh again because that's the same time period as our REMA grids so we don't have any variation on time and differences in mass because we're covering different time periods. And then using this un updated Antarctic Pacific crustal model that Joey alluded to with the sediment layer and seeing whether that's more representative of the kind of local crustal structure. And then the, I'm interested in also how the horizontal signals vary. Can we see where the big sources of load change are? And then eventually we're going to compare that with the GNSS record um, and the vertical elevation time series of the sites and seeing whether there's a significant influence on how we make solutions for GIA. And so just to conclude, this project is a sensitivity kind of test of how elastic uplift in the Amazon Sea embayment is affected by grid resolutions and initial results suggest that there is a low variability at GNSS sites when you change the grid resolution. And then we're going to interested in looking at published surface elevation change estimates and how that varies and using specific crustal profiles and spatial variability and how that varies. Um, yeah, so thank you for listening. Okay, thanks very much. That seems to be an interesting technique and it clearly improves the spatial resolution of your elevation change calculations. With that, I'll turn it to the audience. Are there any quick questions for our last speaker? And I would say, uh, why don't we take a second and acknowledge all of the talks up to this point? That would be great if we've had a great series of talks and sometimes black boxes can seem oppressive to stare at. So thank you to all of our speakers. Okay, I think we should perhaps give something like a minute to ask a question to every speaker sort of in the order they spoke and then we can just let the discussion evolve. So we have a bit of structure. So are there any questions for the first speaker for Tom? Are the speakers still here? We'd yeah. also especially love to hear from, from our early career scientists in the community. So if, if any of you have questions, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, any questions for Mike Willis particularly? Okay, any questions for Miki? I, I have a question. Um, All right. So, so um, you have to, could, uh, this is not a, I, I will preface it by saying this is not a very refined one, because, but I'll do my best to express it. So uh, when you're looking at the, the correlation with distance, do you have to pick a, like a special kernel function? And is this like, does the, the if, if that's the case, does this change how your results turn out? Um, yeah, so the the variogram is kind of like a, I guess a binding, like, you know, spatial relationship function um, that that is, um, that you assume applies to the whole region. Um, and so, you know, I'm, right now we're, we're looking into ways where you, you can do this in like spatially variable regions or you know allow for variability in your variogram um, and we also have a simulation project where we're doing like a training image based simulation so that we don't have to define variograms um, not sure if that answers your question yeah thank you yeah, yeah so the as Miki said the classic take at how to do variogram analysis is you take the experimental data and then you perform a fit. However, you don't have to do that. You can also take the variogram like as a modeling tool and change certain things. Now you shouldn't change them totally, but you can use that to actually modify the outcome. That however requires that you have either a good field understanding of your site or an understanding, say, of the spatial coherence between the two data sets, like radar is different than altimetry, 
which is a typical example, like one is really low resolution, one is really high resolution, what are you gonna do about this? And then that way you can use the modeling ability, like you can just abuse the value gram. And I have a bunch of papers. Back when I was young, I worked on just geostatistics all the time and how to fudge it so it works for geophysical data. And cause it's made for mining data where stuff is more smooth and the objectives are different, but we have all this ancillary information in spatial data. Anyway, send me an email. I don't wanna give people like little geostatistics courses here on the site. While it's good to hear that the stuff is actually sort of being used and people are getting really nice new results, especially like with the mass com combination, I like that. Okay, um, yeah, any specific questions? Yeah. Yeah, Uta, if I could chime in, I just kind of following up on your question or following up on your comment um, about is there any impact because the radar data is also part of the MassCon solution? So is that something that needs to be considered or adds any sort of added complexity? Well, yeah, that's statistically that or physically. Do you want to, you should answer. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, that was something that, that we definitely thought about, but weren't able to address. Um, so we found that, that the input, our input data values um, were often fairly different from the mass conservation estimates and were sometimes outside, uh, well outside of the reported uncertainty range. And I think that's just like a testament to how difficult it is to quantify uncertainty in radar measurements and the fact that you're dealing with spatially variable measurement uncertainty. Um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, the, like I think the optimal approach would be to do some, you know, to do like a Bayesian mass conservation inversion kind of similar to what um, like Doug Brinkerhoff does and then sample from the posterior of that but also modify that inversion to, um, you know, to account for measurement uncertainty and, and also like, you know, maybe consider spatial statistics in there as well. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a really fascinating, complicated problem. <laughs> I think yeah, like the problem might lie more within the theoretical assumptions around the mass conserve approach then with spatial statistics, cause the mass conserve does tend to overestimate, although Rinyo and so forth have gotten, and Mathieu have gotten papers out of saying the troughs are deeper than we see them, they might not be. That may be inherent to the fact that we actually don't have a profile going all the way to the bottom, which is an assumption in the original mass conserve cause they only invert surface, surface information. They don't always have enough data to actually hold this assumption. Anyway, yeah. so yes. I, mean, <laughs> I think at the end of the day, every method is going to have different assumptions. And I think it's useful to, you know, test your, your science on, on different things to see how robust your results are to different assumptions. Actually, can I ask a question to Mike Willis? Mike, you said first you tried is Mike still there? Yep. First, you tried um, to do a supervised classification of the for the feature identification, and then in the end, you settled on an unsupervised approach. Do you um, want to elaborate a bit on that, like what the pros and cons were, or maybe so, just read? So we used the supervised, uh, or uh, the folks at PGC uh, did a semi-manual thresholded and QC'd uh, classification of bedrock in Antarctica. We used that, admitting that that was um, erroneous in many places, we used that as our training data set, and we purely trained the deep learning algorithms, uh, the neural net on the somewhat noisy training data set, then split that data set into two parts and used the 80% for training and 20% for verification. Our model is completely unsupervised once it's trained, uh, the training takes a long, long time, a whole three hours. And as I said, the output is a couple of seconds. So it still hinges though on the supervised training. Um, you, you need a training data set to get these things to work. I mean, that's one of yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, the right. problems with deep learning is you don't have a big enough training data set, which is why we use the data augmentation 
to Im uh, increase the size of our training data set as well. Right, yeah. Yeah, we have someone work on deep learning in our group for a totally different application. Yeah. So it's always good to see like what routes are other people taking, what works in the real world and so forth. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. How about from any of the others in the audience? Do we have any questions for our other speakers? I think it's important that all of my classes have a long awkward pause in them to try and motivate motivate new questions. So we'll let the awkwardness settle in. Now it's not awkward. We've been having quite the discussion so far. Well, I have a question. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. I'll start my video so you can actually see me. For Philip, um, it's very interesting the Meltwater point depths you did with ISAT2. Um, I was saying like there can be different uh, depths and different situations where partially the pond may be partially frozen and things like that. How would you, what would you say about somebody trying to do validation? Um, yeah, so I, I kind of glanced over this in the interest of time, but first of all, on, on most ice shelves, we see melt ponds that are really not that deep. Um, so, so really the, the majority of the melt lakes are less than five meters deep um, in Antarctica at least, um, with a few exceptions. I, I definitely found something that was something like 30 meters deep um, on Shackleton Ice Shelf. And at that point you get into, into like the area where I said to just doesn't, doesn't look that far anymore because you get a really weak return back. Um, then partial ice cover is, can certainly be an issue. And um, there's also some people working on that. So Tree Data, who's also um, contributed an algorithm for us, has some routine for um, discovering where you have a cover on the melt pond. For my own application, where I want to basically generate a training data set of ISA2 depths to train imagery-based uh, methods on. We don't see through the ice cover, so that's just something that wouldn't go into the training data set at all. So I don't really care about ice cover that much. Cool, thank you. You see through the ice cover a little bit, if the ice cover is really thin or if it's snow, I said too has a little bit of penetration. Yes, yes, I agree. Um, com complex cases. Yeah, I I agree. Um, for for my case, generally, then the data just wouldn't be as great. And really, what I care about is that I get the get the data back where I'm really confident that I'm actually seeing these depths and everything else I can ignore if it's if it's not everything that I ignore. So. That that's some of the things I I don't worry too much about, but certainly some of the other people did, and that's also why the different algorithms that have been developed by different people are doing different things because the end goal is certainly very often a different one. Well, is your algorithm tuned for ice, or could it be applied elsewhere? So it essentially could be applied anywhere where you yeah see a top and a bottom um, of some water body. Um, it's, it's also still very much in development, so it's not fully automated. You basically need to, need to already have a melt pond and know where you have a melt pond, and then you throw, throw that data, only that segment of the ATL03 data to the algorithm, and that's essentially what I'm working on now, that, very quickly I can see where there's possibly melt ponds in the data and then look in deeper. I've got a student who will be in touch. <laughs> hey, so Mike, for pro towards product generation, we have been looking into generating a higher resolution, higher order product, sort of like Adel 3 which 
includes results from what we call the DDA bifurcate, originally meant for mate ponds, but it sort of works everywhere. And so this is a research product which we are funded to develop and share with people. And we have, you have this opportunity to hit us up and say, okay, here are some features which are totally different than what we've looked at before, which will provide cases for robustness. And the algorithm is entirely automatic because it's supposed to run ice sheet wide. And it does actually, we're putting it on the NASA cloud to generate a product in, I don't want to make any promises, not too far down the line. But then again, I just, I'm, I'm on the sea level team and I'm thinking on shallow waters on the coast, that might be very useful. Well, Lori Makuda and Chris, what's his name, have looked into that a bit, but yes, so there are a bunch of algorithms out there and people are looking into making algorithms. However, the most important thing is almost the more I look at this, the better because there are so many photons out there, you can't really find all the regions oh, where stuff doesn't work or where you find a case that actually makes the algorithm sick up and so forth. So anything you find, yes, especially weird cases, chip them over. You got lots of those. I just, I, I would like to ask Philip um, sort of a follow-up, maybe like looking towards the future because don't get me wrong, ISAT2 is my favorite satellite and it does such amazing stuff. But at the end of the day, right, it's not going to solve all of our problems regarding um, melt ponds just because it can't sample. I know, right? <laughs> it can't sample, you know, every place at all the time. So, you know, I, I'm sure that maybe you might speak a little bit to sort of, is there this future marriage between imagery and ISAT2 that's you're working on or that you see potentially coming down the road to help basically, you know, take what I said to can give us and then make it more widespread. Yes, so, so, so that's, that's essentially what my PhD project is supposed to be and what I also um, propose to NASA and have been funded for. So the, yeah, the plan is essentially to look at where, where we can reliably extract meltwater depths from ISAT-2 and then check whether other satellites that produce imagery that have a great coverage, like mostly Landsat-8 and Sentinel-2, I guess, um, where those overlap with these. And then when we have coincident imagery and ISAT-2 data, we can use that to make these comparisons and basically try to find that relationship between the meltwater depths that we find from ISAT-2 and the multispectral reflectances um, from the satellite imagery. I'm looking forward to that, <laughs> seeing it, thanks. You also need to tune the Landsat imagery, don't you, for the lake depths, if I'm not mistaken? Yes, so the plan is to look at Landsat and at Sentinel-2. Right, well, do we have some questions perhaps for the solid earth geophysicists? To not give them the short here with all the land ice discussion. I have kind of an open. Uh, sorry, did someone else have a question? Matt? Yes. Hi. Go ahead. I have a question for Jasmine. And I was wondering if you're thinking about looking into the, this uh, resolution dependence issue for the viscous response to ongoing mass changes. It's not something that I personally am looking at, but I suppose the grids that we, we produce could use that. I don't have any background in viscoelastic modeling, purely working on that, the kind of that top section kind of realm of things really. Um, but I agree, it would be interesting because the response here is so fast and so kind of variable and, and just different from most other places that it is around the globe. I think it would be interesting and I wonder whether it would have more of an effect than it would do in cases where we have a high viscosity upper mantle. But um, it's not something that I have any knowledge of how to do at the moment. Okay. We've been working with Sam's Gaia Pi model to model forward simulations of ice sheet evolution in this region. 
but we haven't looked at the mesh, mesh resolution issue yet. So I was just curious if that was, it seems like you have most of the tools in place where you could investigate that pretty easily with this pretty cool mass change data product you've put together. Yeah, I would definitely be something I'd be interested in doing. I haven't really looked or thought about it, but um, yeah, maybe I'll be in touch because I do, all of these grids exist, you know, at varying resolutions. Um, so, yeah. All right, cool. Thanks. Okay, do we have any other questions? If not, last call, would anyone of the 40 some participants also like to ask a question? If not, doesn't seem to be the case. We should give another hand to our speakers and wrap this up. How are we making some noise? Let's make some noise. Very good. Okay, thank you all for participating. And there are some, for those of you, you all have the wise agenda, right? So there should be some more sessions coming up the rest of this week and also through next Friday, as Matt Secret pointed out. So good luck with the rest of the online wise meeting. <laughs>